much for having me. And, as Maurice said, I'll be giving you an account called Feast and Famine of the excavations and monitoring between Guardbridge and St Andrews that was carried out primarily earlier this year. Uh, I'm just going to go through a quick whiz through what I'm going to be talking about today. Start with a very brief introduction, then uh, the location of the pipeline, uh, give you some information about the results from the monitoring and the subsequent excavation. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the artifacts we found and the analysis we've had done on them, and then present some very brief conclusions. I'll get the boring legalese stuff out of the way first. Uh, Arcus Cultural Heritage were commissioned by Vital Energy, who were the uh, primary construction management on site, to undertake archaeological monitoring during groundbreaking works associated with the construction of a renewable energy centre and district heating pipeline between Guardbridge and St Andrews. And the uh, monitoring and excavation was carried out over 86 days, uh, end of last year, from November through to August this year, by Alistair Rees, Ross Cameron and myself. Um, the project was for St Andrews' university's ambition to become carbon neutral sometime over the next two decades, I think it is. And it cost them £25 million pounds in total, which is a significant amount of money. But hopefully it should provide some very significant benefits. Um, we have a biomass boiler in Guard Bridge, so that's at the, uh, the western end. I'll show you what location in a couple of minutes. And it's essentially a, a huge wood fire boiler. And that will be heating water, which is fed through the pipes you can see here. Um, and these are very special insulated pipes. They've never been used in Britain before. It's Danish design, I believe. And uh, over the four and a half miles from Garbridge Heating Centre to St Andrews University, they should only lose the water should only lose two degrees, which is quite phenomenal, I'm told. And uh, this is the location of the project. I'm sure most of you know roughly where it was. But here we have St Andrews down at the bottom right there. Guardbridge, top left, and the interestingly coloured line is the route of the pipeline through the rural area. Uh, don't worry too much about the zones, the numbers at the minute, although I would like to draw your attention to Zone 8 here, which is where we found the most interesting archaeology. But briefly, for those of you who aren't aware, I'd like to run through what a watching brief is. Uh, archaeological monitoring and watching brief are interchangeable terms in commercial archaeology. And it describes a formal program of observation and investigation conducted during any operation carried out for non-archaeological reasons, uh, normally construction development, as in this case. And uh, you know, this will be put on a project in a planning condition when deemed necessary by the local curatorial body, who in this case were Fife Council. And the watching brief allows the preservation by record of any archaeological deposits found along the site. Uh, with respect to this project specifically, as you can see from this picture, um, they were stripping topsoil along the route of the pipeline primarily. And this is so it can be kept separate and reinstated at the end of the project, which keeps the, uh, the ground fertile, keeps it nice and tidy. It's best practice to do that. And so they'll, they'll topsoil strip down to natural subsoil, for a section of about half a mile, and then they'll go in and dig their pipe trench, which goes about a metre to a metre and a half into the subsoil itself. Topsoil stripping in archaeology, many of you are probably aware, but for those of you who aren't, is very useful for us because once the subsoil is revealed, theoretically that should be uh, untouched by modern activity, and so we can see any archaeological deposits or artifacts that might pop up. Oops. There were a few difficulties associated with this project specifically. Um, as you can see, picture on the bottom left. Uh, within Guardbridge and St Andrews themselves, the, the pipe trenches went through very heavily disturbed ground, disturbed by modern construction and service trenches, and uh, there was a lot of landscaping going on as well. So we found very little in a way, actual archaeology within either of the towns at each end of the project. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the topsoil stripping in between the two towns, um, Unfortunately, I mean, we should have had a corridor about 10 metres wide, as we saw from the previous program. Uh, sorry, slide about 10 metres wide down to subsoils, had a good coverage. 
But because um, many of the farmers whose land the project went through wanted the subsoil and topsoil kept very separately, they asked the client to strip down to above the subsoil level, so there was still topsoil left on. So archaeologically that's almost useless because there's still topsoil there to plough soil. We can't see anything really. We agreed with the client that that was okay as long as when they were doing their pipe trench, we could go in and as you can see here from the picture on the bottom right, they would strip a little bit down to subsoil, so the width of a digger bucket, which is the width of their pipe trench. So we should be able to see any archaeology turned up and uh, we're happy that out with that trench would be negligible impact on any surviving remains. Uh, <laughs> the results of the monitoring for the first few months was negligible in the extreme. We found some land drains, plow marks, all of these common agricultural remains, post-medieval, and of very little archaeological significance. There was an area where there was a known site that we thought might have been impacted by the development. You can see here on the slide, uh, it's the Seafield Brick and Tile Works, 19th century brick and tile works. And this is the uh, second edition Ordnance Survey map, 1895, overlaid with a modern aerial photograph to give you some idea of what's there. And as you can see, the, uh, the pipeline, well, the road that runs from top left to bottom right, the A92, the pipeline hugs that just to the south. Brick and tile works there. Uh, all those buildings are demolished. You can see uh, left central part, there's a large clay pit, and that's still visible as a depression in the ground. And uh, sort of top right, there's a line coming down. And that represents a tram line that would have connected the brick and tile works to the coast. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing related to that visible. Uh, when we went through that area, the only thing we found was a rough surface near the site, uh, demarcated by that red line there, and it was probably an exterior yard surface. It was very rough, uh, clinker and brick fragment built, and in the top soil there was a lot of brick and tile fragments, probably from the demolition of the works, but there were no structural remains we found, so that was a bit disappointing. However, um, I think it was Towards the end of June, um, my colleague Alistair Reese and myself were monitoring Zone 8, just northeast of King Cable, uh, within a kilometre of the village, uh, two kilometres east of Guard Bridge, up there. And we found several prehistoric features, 16 in total, I think it was. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see from that photo there, it was on a slightly elevated plateau, which may have been significant for their placement. Um, the ground actually falls away behind, that's me there, so behind there it falls away, there it falls away, and also this side. So an elevated area, and actually most of the pipeline was going through very low lying ground, probably a couple of metres above sea level to five metres, but here we're maybe ten metres, so that's probably significant. Um, the features were all very shallow, diffuse, uh, very soft sand, the natural around it was. And so this made identification quite hard, and uh, actual excavation was very light and easy, but it was very easy to overcut features. As you can see here, very ephemeral, vague shapes. Uh, just to give you an idea of the what we found here, we have our post X plan of part of the site. Um, the uppermost line is, let's see, this is a large area of uh, trample, possibly where animals were kept, I'm not sure. It was about maybe less than 20 centimetres deep, a very irregular base. Uh, I think one tiny bit of debitage came out of that, so very barren. Uh, the middle line is a curved linear feature, it may relate to a building, but it was very shallow, six to ten centimetres. I mean, it's likely that these would have been truncated by ploughing. Uh, you know, in later years, but still, the shallow nature of it doesn't suggest it was a building, so very strange. Then on the bottom row we have a, a little ditch and then a couple of pits. I'd like to draw your attention to pit 819. That's where we found the majority of the artefacts, and some very nice artefacts they were too. I think another thing to point out from this slide is 
just how awkward it is when you're dealing with a very narrow strip through what could be a, a much larger site. I mean, from east to west, over 10, 200 meters. Um, so huge amount of features really for Neolithic as it turned out to be. Um, but we don't know how far they extended north or south of the trench, and it's quite hard to interpret from a little strip like this. Uh, the results, most features, well, all features were investigated, and most were very shallow and ephemeral, as I mentioned before. Uh, the vast majority, I think 11 out of the 16 features were archaeologically sterile, so no finds whatsoever. Uh, a few did contain small ceramic fragments and flint flakes, but by far the most interesting feature on site was, as I mentioned before, 819. And that was chock full of artifacts, as you can possibly see here. Um, on the left, we have, these are both mid-ex photos, which, you know, several lovely shirts of pottery. On the right, the uh, darker things within the centre of the picture are flint tools, quite nice craftsmanship and uh, a huge number of artefacts from this one pit compared to the rest of the site. Um, 14 flint and chert lithics found across the site. We had nine in this pit, and it, they were much higher quality flint, uh, finer workmanship, and much larger, just much nicer pieces. You can see some of them here. There's a blade scraper on the left-hand side one, and the side scraper on the right, and possible butchery tool top there. Really nice flint work. Um, Torben Ballin has done the lithic analysis for us and he suggests a middle to later Neolithic date for all the artefacts. Um, the black flint recovered from pit 819 was probably from further, well it was definitely from outside Scotland. Could have been from Yorkshire but quite likely from even further south. So Travelled a fair distance, quite valuable stuff, considered quite exotic and important by those who use it and subsequently deposited it. Um, we actually sent off five of the finest pieces from Pit 819 to a useware specialist, uh, Peter Jensen from Southampton University. And uh, his study showed that while all the tools had been used, all five that he examined had been used. They were not exhausted, so they could well have been reused. And as I'm sure many of you know, it's quite awkward to source in Scotland. So the fact that these tools could have been reused but were in fact deposited in this pit suggests it's important. There was, an, there was some intention behind the deposition, possibly ritual ceremonial, we don't know, but beyond the purely functional, let's say. Um, he also suggests, quite intriguingly, that all five artifacts he examined may have been a toolkit from one person um, due to uh, similarities in the flint and the workmanship. Uh, but he says not, probably not a specialist toolkit, so not a carpenter's or a butcher's toolkit, but maybe, maybe a farmer, someone who needs tools for various different purposes, multifunctional if you will. Um, as you can see from this slide, there's a microscopic uh, edge damage to this blade scraper and uh, he interpreted this as showing it had been used for planing or debarking wood. And we also had a scraper that was used for uh, butchery and one that was used for uh, scraping hides and then a couple of other ones might have been used for trimming wood. So you know, very different purposes. Um, we also found lots of ceramics in that pit. Um, we had in total approximately 110 the confusion comes from a lot of them are very, very small fragments. Um, so I'm going to break apart and become more, so the, the final count might be close to 120, say. But of these 110, 98 were recovered from the fill of this one pit. Um, we haven't had the full ceramic analysis done yet, but Anne McSween has done a preliminary assessment, and she suggests all the diagnostic shows you can see are middle or later nearly the crude were. The date matches up with the flint work we found. And she also says that remains from at least four and potentially several more vessels were present. Uh, just took a few pictures here because oh, I just thought it was lovely, really nicely decorated prehistoric pottery. Some of the nicest I've ever seen. Um, one on the bottom left, the incised markings, very typical of grooved ware. 
the hole, possibly a repair hole. I thought because it was that close to the rim, it might be part of a bucket handle, possibly. On the bottom right, you've got one with uh, little pinch marks. Some of my finger and thumb's gone in there when the clay's wet and made that. And then incised cord decoration up around the top of the rim. So, uh, Anne McSween also suggested that some of the ceramic shirts you found were remarkably similar to a ceramic assemblage that she studied from Darrington Walls. So that's an intriguing connection. So, to conclude, uh, the vast majority of the development routes were shown to be archaeologically sterile, um, hence the famine. Uh, however, the extent of the features discovered in Zone 8 indicates that really sizable area of Neolithic occupation. And as I said, 200 metres from end to end, that's a fairly sizable Neolithic site, in my experience. Um, dating and interpreting the site is slightly awkward. I mean, all the dateable material we had from, from that one pit was fairly within the centre, so we'd like to get some more dating material from either end to see if it was a multi-phase site or you know, used over a single period of time. Uh, but yeah, again, middle to date to Neolithic date, hopefully. Um, and we're currently undertaking a post excavation research design and we'd like to be doing that in order to enhance our understanding of the site. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.